Uh, my name is Matt O'Donnell. Uh, at, here at the college, my official role is actually as associate editor of Bowdoin Magazine. Uh, I also work closely with the Outing Club, and I run um, the Fish House Poetry website. And so we're kind of combining the two uh, with this weekend, combining uh, the, the poetry and the Outing Club, and we're really happy to have Sebastian Matthews up here. And this is uh, kicking off a great weekend. After Sebastian reads, uh, we're taking... Uh, some Bowdoin Outing Club students out onto the trail to do a writing workshop in the Western Mountains. And uh, so this is only the beginning tonight. Uh, a, l a little bit about Fish House. Fish House is um, an audio archive of emerging poets and started it um, in 2004. And I'm really, really pleased to have Sebastian uh, up here to read at Bowdoin tonight because uh, he was one of the first poets that we published on Fish House when we first got going. And uh, you know, one of the first ones uh, to to submit work to us when we were just starting out and take a chance on us. So I am indebted to him for that. And uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm actually going to uh, turn the mic over to Zach Roberts, uh, who's going to introduce Sebastian. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about rain this weekend. I don't know how it's going to happen with writing. Um, so, uh, Sebastian Matthews. Um, Sebastian Matthews uh, is a graduate of the University of Michigan's MFA program, uh, and he teaches part-time at Warren Wilson College and edits uh, Rivendell, a place-based uh, literary journal. He's the author of the memoir In My Father's Footsteps and co-editor with Stanley Plumley of Search Partly. Um, which is the collected poems of William Matthews. Uh, his poems have appeared in such publications as um, Atlantic Monthly, uh, the New England Review, Post Road, the Seneca Review, Tin House, and the Virginia Quarterly Review, among many others. Uh, Matthews was a recent Broadloaf Scholar, broad Breadloaf Scholar, which is Breadloaf Scholar uh, in nonfiction. His chapbook, Coming to Flood, was published by Holly Ridge Press in 2005. And his full-length collection of poems, We Generous, was published by Red Hen Press uh, just this past February. He lives in uh, Asheville, North Carolina. So, everybody, Sebastian Matthews. Before I put this thing on, I'm going to actually, I, I think this might be the first time, a first in the poetry world, uh, I have my mom here to be my opening act. Uh, Marie Harris is a poet, and uh, she and I, and actually Betsy Scholl, um, I had the opportunity when I was about 14, I think, to be in a workshop with these two and a bunch of other poets, um, and uh, have kept going to that workshop on and off for years. And um, my mom has been the poet laureate of New Hampshire and has a few books out herself. Um, and I thought she should come and read you guys a few poems before I start. Marie Harris. It's not every day you get to have your son introduce you. Thank you very much. Um, I had a couple of poems that I was going to read, but um, my new friend Kim reminded me um, of something that happened a couple of months ago that was so awesome, is that Garrison Keillor discovered one of my poems, I have no idea how, and read it on his writer's almanac. So I thought maybe I'd, I'd read it here again. It's called Standard Plumbing. Plumbing supply places like auto parts stores have long counters with bar stools for the customers. When I came in, the man behind the counter was telling a story about the time he and his friends had decided to celebrate getting home from Vietnam and had bought a lot of scotch and given one bottle to a wino who drank half of it all at once and dropped dead. Then the man, with Walter stitched on his shirt, asked what he could do for me, and I told him I had come to buy a toilet the cheapest, most basic toilet they had. 
he wanted to know if I was putting it in one of my apartments or something, and I said no, it was for my own house. And I was, oddly enough, buying a toilet for the first time because we were installing indoor plumbing. The other houses I'd lived in had always come with toilets, and I'd never given much thought to choosing one, though today I'd kind of decided I wanted bone, not white. So in the process of getting the bowl and the tank and the seat and some pipes and gaskets from the warehouse, we got to talking about our outhouses. And he allowed us how the one he had in Florida when he was a kid in the 50s hadn't been all that bad except for the bugs and sometimes a snake. And we both agreed that there are times out there when you see things from an unusual vantage. For instance, that view of the night sky in winter is unparalleled. The second poem I'm going to read um, is an elegy, which of course you know is a, a poem remarking upon the death of someone. And um, it happened that uh, this poem takes place in um, Harpswell and um, has a, a certain personal um, vibe for me and for Sebastian. But I think probably I'll just simply read it to you because I don't think that one has to know personal details to understand a poem. This is called Mackerel Sky Elegy. At anchor near the silky brown verge of a tidal mudflat, I do not seem to pose a threat to the great blue stalking the shallows. It is alert to my small movements in the cockpit. I smooth a wind-lifted page, raise and lower binoculars, yet it displays an almost studied lack of concern. So too, as I tack past the green can and Falmouth Forsyth's teeming harbor, the osprey in its unkempt nest Mottled harbor seals on ledges drying in the retreating tide, the solitary loon. Nothing startles. Even when I slip off the boat at sunset and swim toward a raft of turns, there is no consternation, no flight. I sail into Harpswell Harbor. On the chart, this piece of the main coast looks like a mackerel sky, striated, mysterious. I've never been here by land or sea, yet I feel an inexplicable sadness. Now I remember. At the funeral, men with cropped silver hair and flecked beards told stories about that summer place, how they gave each other nicknames and drank good wine and smoked fine cigars. Oh, how they laughed. How they remembered you. From this vantage, Anchored in the very cove you and your friends must have overlooked from a porch on warm, foggy evenings long after you and I had anything left to say to one another. I can almost see you, as if through a screen, in profile, cigarette in one hand, snifter in the other, holding forth. You seem at ease, even happy. Then suddenly, peripherally, you notice me, momentarily taken aback, the surface of your composure fractures like moonlight on a windy bay. But you neither turn nor move away. You must sense that I am only here for this evening with no intention of startling. And I, this must be why I have come to say goodbye. And I'll read um, two, two more poems. One of them in my capacity as Poet Laureate of New Hampshire, I was, I was um, roped into writing poems um, on occasions. And one of the occasions was the um, <laughs> inauguration of um, two governors, actually. And the, and the first one I was asked to do, I, I did with pleasure. She was the first female governor of New Hampshire. And it was just a joy to write a poem on, on the occasion of her inauguration. But the second one was a guy that I couldn't stand. Um, and I said to the person who wrote me into this, how can I possibly do this? And he said, you're not writing a poem about this man. You're writing a poem about the occasion. So I thought to myself, all right. And um, I thought, what do I need to say to this man that I can't stand? And, and here's what I said. It's called New Year, New Hampshire, on the occasion of the inauguration of Craig Benson as the 79th governor of New Hampshire, January 9th, 2003. The hunger moon draws icy tides upriver, heaving gray-green slabs of seawater onto the salt marshes. Inland, a house rides snow swells into evening, 
while inside, the householder, satisfied in the knowledge of a well-provisioned root cellar, a woodshed stacked with even cords, pulls the shutters to, turns from the darkening window. And still, quarrelsome winds bay down the chimney. The urge to retreat to hearth and leather-bound studies of certainty is as strong as the pull of the moon. But there are times when, we, when what we may need most are the rude and raucous disputations that sputter and spark like bonfires on frozen ponds, attracting a quorum of neighbors. And finally, a poem that is, was written at exactly this time of year. In my town, we actually have a peach orchard, which is something that just stuns me still, that in New Hampshire there's such a thing as a peach orchard. I thought that was only Georgia or something. And um, this is a poem about peaches and about um, uh, doing strange things in boats and about love. It's called Reprieve. The hardy little trees at Union Lake Orchard have given up their bounty, and today the remains, imperfect red havens and harmonies, Madisons, bells, and beauties, are heaped willy-nilly in a shallow wooden box on a plywood table. Seconds. This harvest is a second chance, another run at summer, like the one we took upriver last evening a late sail before a soft wind into the grassy, shadowy shallows. September sunset stained the salmon falls like the deep garnet bruises on this season's last peaches, sweet reminders of longer days. We fell asleep before moonrise, before the last of the tide's ebb, and were woken in the gray of 2 a.m. by the suck and settle of the boat as it sighed, then tilted, into the river's bed of dark mud. Nothing for it to, but to brace against the steep list and wait, like those terracotta Chinese guardians of tombs for the turning of the tide. Thanks. Thank you, Sebastian. You guys, thanks for coming out tonight. I know Friday night there's a lot of stuff to do. I'm excited about this trip we're going to take. Um, this hike. So some of the, what I'm going to read tonight is about walking and about being outside. Um, before I begin, I want to thank Matt for what he does as a poet, uh, what he does with fi from the Fish House, of course, and what he does here at Bowdoin. It's, it's a really, tr it's a big treat to be here. And uh, I want to thank the Bowdoin Outing Club as well. I'm going to read some new poems and um, some poems from this book, and maybe a little bit of a little bit of prose in the middle. Um, I'm not going to read too long. I'll read for probably 20 minutes. So kind of keep your your clocks, your your boredom clocks tuned. I'll tr I'll try to keep you awake. Oh, speaking of that, um, I have a four-year-old boy named Avery, and good night, Avery. I love you very much. Go to bed, listen to your mom. This is called Ars Poetica Blues. Writing a poem is like making a paper airplane. One morning you wake up with this urge to build something light that might fly. You spend a few hours tinkering, trying out this model, that design, finding the spot in the sun at the corner of your corner table and the corner of the building on the corner. You're three floors up, so your ideas will have immediate room to let themselves out into, the, into their full bloom of falling. Then later, after you've given up on silly notions, after a litany of drudgery, return to the drawing table and whip up some miniature Wright Brother origami and fling it out the open window, left open by a lover who left your life three lifetimes ago. It almost flies over empty fields, land, landing safely or in a pile or exploding into flames lighting a whole hamlet with its incandescence, and you jump out after it or you stay in your chair as the sun pulls back its one great assertion in a huge roll of teletype paper, teletype paper pinprick with stars. And no one has seen a thing except the man on the corner with his hand down his pants who looks like Whitman or a beat cop or one of those beat generation wannabes you used to be, smoking hand rolls and dreaming of Ginsburg, dreaming of Blake, 
and no one cares, nor do you really anymore, though your dreams are a wartime sky, tiny droning planes in all the corners, and the rest of the night is a long battle, and the bottles on the table rattle as the milk truck tanks roll by. I live in Asheville, North Carolina, up in the mountains, the other end of this Appalachian chain. And um, we go down sometimes to Folly Beach down in, the, in South Carolina and uh, get lost down there for a week or so. This poem is set there. It's called A Note Left to the Next Group of Vacationers Staying Here in This Rental Cabin. And I, I wrote it as we left. I didn't leave it for the people, but I was kind of imagining what I'd say to the next group. Um, Ignore the wasps under the bed, lying dormant on the sills. They're only sleeping through the off-season lull. The cleaning crew left them on purpose, talismanic reminder of our own terminus. Try to forget them as you turn out the light of your childhood fear. Don't read the side table literature. It's only a siren call to your sleeping nature. See if you can ignore the morning chainsaw buzz, a sort of prayer to industry in the face of hurricanes to come. Drop your cell over the fence into the dumpster where the workers pitch bottles day after day. Trust me on this. It took us all week, but we ordered the waves into a hierarchy of pleasure. From easy jumper to, oh no, to I'm going under. Our tally taped to the outdoor shower. Make sure to rent rusted out bikes from the 12 hour drunk, lost in his 12 steps, who leaves notes on his door that cry, I'm at the beach or trek to the edge of the dunes where the crowds dissipate and pass deep into the silence of your body as it moves mutely among its ancestors. Find the point where beach and marsh become one, where land and water French kiss. Birds will look at you for wings before making way. Now, step further into the questioning day. It's probably one of my favorite moments of being on a beach when you finally walk past yourself, and you, outside of yourself, and you're finally out and uh, you kind of walk back fresh. Um, one of the things that's exciting about this next, this next couple of days, this trip we're going to take, is we're going to talk and read and, and write a little bit on the trail. And I do that, it's kind of dorky, but I do it all the time. I write and read while I walk on trails and, and trip and run into things. Um, it's a good place for me to get my um, inspiration or, or my ideas. And, I work at a college, I think in some ways similar to Bowdoin, maybe a little more like Bates. Uh, it's called Warren Wilson College, and we have a, a beautiful campus, a, a lots of acres of trails, and beautiful river, a uh, very dirty, beautiful river that we're trying to clean up. And we have work day where we all go and clean it. And I, this is my, really the only work I did that six hour period was the work on this poem, I think. So I, was, I failed miserably, but I, I got this poem. It's called River Cleanup. And I stole the first line from a friend. So Curtis, if you're watching, I'm sorry. The utility pole is coming out of its dream of being a tree. And the snake you spy on the elbow of a fallen branch turns out to be a bike tire threaded into a nest of debris by last year's flood. You pull until it slips out in a long, wet arc and then drop it into your workday bag, weighted down with sodden sweater, styrofoam cups, water bottles, cigarette butts. Ask a poet to clean up a river, and he'll get all Thoreauvian on you. I dallied half an hour on one bend, pretending to scour for micro-trash, instead following the errant path of a leaf gilding its windy song line. The breeze shuddering the trees, nothing new, nothing new. It took some time, but then sight sharpened, and I could make out the plastic bags lining all that muck. Could find the wire and the bramble. Ask a poet to work like this, and he'll jump right in. It'll take a ringing bell and free food to bring him back in. I did eat the lunch. Um, read this one for you, Matt. I'm not a, a hunter, but I think I find myself often out where hunters are, trying not to get shot. Um, I have a brown dog, so sometimes I worry. Um, but this is a poem about bears and honey. It's called Ancestor.
bears have been following me around again. I saw one the other day across the road, snuffling about in his nature center pen up from the polluted river and in sight of the public golf course. And just tonight, I caught this snippet of National Geographic on television, a hunter describing how he shot this young bear. He was crouching somewhere in the field, face turned from the camera as he told his story. The man spoke forthrightly of seeing it coming, of knowing the bear hadn't spotted him, of making a decision. If the bear walked into his area, he'd shoot. If he drifted off, he'd let him go his way. He came into my view, he said, and so raised the gun. Then the bear turned to look at me, and I shot him. The hunter went on, his speech slowing, faltering. With distinct sadness, the hunter described the bullet entering the bear, exploding inside the animal. If it wasn't remorse, he choked on. It wasn't remorse, he choked on. He had done what he had set out to do. No, I am sure it was recognition I saw clouding his face. He went down quick, he said. He didn't know what hit him. This is where you pan to the moose. There's a big moose up there. Actually, poems are funny. I, I had an experience of, I've always loved bears and been afraid of them, which is probably an appropriate response. And um, I've always wanted to see one in person. We were talking about seeing a moose. Um, and I finally ran into one on a public golf course where I walk a lot. I trespass on my, on my local public golf course. And I ran into the bear, like between me and you, like that far. We just walked past each other. And that's where the poem was. I was trying to write a poem about that. And by the time I was finished this poem, he was gone. And, and so sometimes what you start with, you shouldn't be afraid to let it go. Um, OK. Green man walking. Anybody know what a green man is? You guys know what a green man is? No. It's kind of a. Well, I'll just read the poem. You'll, now that I said it, you'll start to see the green man all over the place. Green man walking. There will always be sky days, intervals through which we stroll light-footed and easy, lifetimes that fill up with cloud expanse, then pull back the curtain to blue, bluster, and breeze, autumn fully here, a current of winter in the air. Then there are two, the ground days, those downtrodden, dark and damp spans you trudge through, deadheaded, as if legs were sodden logs, your head a block of cement in the current, tree roots pulled from the sludge at every step. Worse still, the empty ghost days, numb corridor afternoons, uninhabited, shadows and light, flimsy, blind, fluttering, no one home. Trance to the store for milk, two days this side of souring, Litany of lists, one ads, lost hours, stalking the cage. I want to be a green man walking, to bring sky and ground with me as I move in my life, not dragging them behind in a storm wake, but carry their elements within, a whole season of life in my diurnal blood, astride the day and in time. Feet gnarled tree roots, head frosted with turning leaves, heart pumping out the morning's bird call, breath of breeze after a day of deadening heat, to come to the scarred table of the world, avid, grateful, and share in its bounty. I've been working, uh, I write nonfiction as well, um, on a piece about walking um, forever. And uh, I'm just going to read you a page and a half of kind of a manifesto of, of walking. Um, It's called Out Walking. Walking is a way to circle back on life. To take a walk is to call time out, to admit a certain overwhelm in relation to the day. I'll be out walking, you say, back in a few hours. Sometimes a walk is as sacred as conscious as a walking meditation. You move step by step, breath by breath through the moment. Other times it's just a tramp to the store for the paper, a chance to stretch the body and let the mind off its leash. The change in pace regenerates your energy, reconnects you with the world. Snow melting, sun out, birds and trees, or you lose everything you've stored up in the space between here and back. 
Some walks are accompanied by the dutiful shadow of shame. You try to outpace it, remove it from your feet, but the shadow keeps on you. On these walks, the crows come out and fly at the back of your head. Nothing suits you and nothing feels good. Thoughts are torn bits of cloth flapping at your knees. Once in a while, however, the shadow vanishes and the crows turn back for home base. Freeing your steps, you walk quickly into a new region of the day. Then there are the ticktown walks, rambles with that dissipate nervous energy. Their looping routes allow interior monologues to play out their haphazard ends. There are paths you find yourselves in, left simply with your steps and the day around you, the quality of light. In its purest form, a walk burns off second thoughts. In its basest, it's dead time, sleepwalk, static. It's funny how you can forget that this transition is not tangible, the road turning from tar to dirt, the clouds lifting, not a place or time to navigate toward. You're deceived over and over, the dog going for the master's throw. If you're not careful, your walks become bent solely toward the purpose of release and redemption. Accordingly, you often come home and immediately fall dead asleep, refusing to wake up until the storm cloud has passed. Technique, this technique does me no good. It is a postponement. Walking is actually seeing. Of course, you go out walking anyway, hoping to make an escape to come upon brief golden moments of presence. You walk toward and into this immersion as a way to maintain hope. You have walked this way sometimes aimlessly and desperately, sometimes purposefully, regally, nearly all your life. Wherever you land, whether city or country, suburban streets, apartment complexes, backwoods, or long country roads, you are inclined to head out on a journey. In a flash, you've turned your new surroundings into the familiar realm of mythic imagination. It is one of the ways you define yourself, that essential something about you, the way someone becomes a bird watcher, a handball player, a shade gardener. You say, I'm a walker. I think I've thrown everything else out but these two pages, so I'm back to this. Um, okay, I'm going to read you some new poems. I think I have four of them, and, then that, and that's going to be it for tonight. But they're, they're a little longer. Um, and um, no, the last one's not. But the, I have three poems, and I've been working on them for the last couple months and just got two of them tuned up by a friend. One of the best things about writing poems is having friends who write poems and helping you make them better. Um, this one is called Skywalker. And, um, and you just, you go f you'll figure it out, but uh, it's easier to figure out on the page than it is in the reading. There are two days that this, this, this um, poem is set on. It's, it's dedicated to my wife, Allie, uh, and it's for her birthday. And so that one of the walks in this poem is set on her birthday. And the other day is my father's death day, and it's actually it's almost the same day of his birthday, right on the same time, which was two weeks before. So you get two different walks that kind of get conflated. Um, and there are a lot of different versions of what a skywalker is in this poem, but the main one, as it will be, be self-evident, is a guy named David Thompson, who was a great basketball player that I loved dearly as a kid. Um, when he was a, the kind of, when maybe the first version of Michael Jordan, maybe, that the league had seen. No one had seen anything like this guy. He could really play. Um, so, you should see it. Out in the field, a gang of wax wings swarming low over corn stubble converging in the field perching in the trees, screeches metal sheets rubbing over the river. They swoop in the sky as a single organism, escher dance of white body to black, one huge bird in flight, now a thousand on the ground, waving wings in unison, a distinct wook like laundry snap taut as they turn and bank in the late afternoon light. I ever, have I ever told you how in the airport my father ran into David Thompson? our favorite basketball player, Skywalker, the skinny, rocket-legged forward who dunked on the heads of slow-footed seven-footers. They'd bumped into each other in line for coffee, he'd always say, sitting down for a few moments of light banter, two elegant men, tall, the poet and the athlete. I was thinking about this the other day when I found an old, faded, red, white, and blue ABA basketball trapped in a tree branch, bobbling in the river's hands. I was brooding on my father, who died on this day nine years ago, so fished the ball out and brought it to you. Can you decipher this childhood talisman, made slick first by hands and hard court, then water? 
Will you help me bury it in these woods by the river? When I return to the corn, the day is newly written, and the wax rings have given way to crows marauding in the trees, lost in a mystery play, a floating crap game of complaint, my old friends. Here's what the man must have said. First, how do you dance along that thin strip of baseline like that, brother? Then, how do you sketch words in the sky so birds come together to rant inside the clouds? Easy. I'm just a reporter standing at the edge of the field waiting out the tornado. That's funny. Sometimes I'm a hawk swooping, others a baseline pulsing. The ball disappears in my hand. Yes, yes, it's as if vision goes so fast into its next correct place that you meet it coming back. When you jump up, you are really two forces converging. Passion is all the body needs for intelligence. I say, sometimes the wind hinders, sometimes the wind helps. Skywalker laughs. Then, I'll miss my flight, Dad. Good luck tonight. Don't let Dr. J go off in the third. I turn the bend in the river, dog out ahead on the prowl, your face conjured, and blow out as inspired breath a kiss to you. One of the things that I do as a poet is I kind of walk around looking for things to spark me. And th this is one of those moments when the day of my dad's death, I ran into a, literally an, an ABA basketball in the middle of the river. And it's just like, what the? Because I used to live in a town up in the Denver, Col near B Boulder, Colorado. We used to watch these games. And I'd go, I had to climb into the middle of the river and got the basketball. And so that was like, okay, I got to write a poem. And then that line, um, sometimes the wind hinders, sometimes the wind helps. I was, a couple of weeks later, I was walking along trying to write this poem. And it was a windy day. And my, one of my neighbors, an old guy, was raking leaves. And I, uh, he didn't say anything. I just kind of looked at the huge pile of leaves. And he just looked at me kind of like, you know. And then he said to me, sometimes the wind hinders, sometimes the wind helps. <laughs> And I was like, oh, man, that's a line. I, I just took it and put it in the poem. Um, when did Elia come and read here, Matt? Elia Kaminsky. Yeah, uh, that's February. Uh, I heard this poet and met him read this summer up at Breadloaf at the Writers' Conference up in Vermont. And, he, and the reading was so powerful that I decided to write a poem about it. And I think that the poem speaks for itself, but I, I kind of want you just to imagine this space. If, the, if we're in a, imagine it's a kind of a theater. It's called the Little Theater. Very long space with uh, a, a stage and a poet. So behind me would be a stage, and you guys would be in these seats that would go, would go gradually up in rafters to a tech booth at the top that was built for the, the lighting and stuff. And on the sides of the theater are just screen, do screen doors and uh, open to the outside up into the mountains. So it's a very beautiful space. Hearing Elia read for the first time. Ten minutes before the reading begins, the place nearly empty, the wind picked up outside, bumping the screen doors lightly against their stops. The young Russian poet is shuffling from seat to seat, dropping a handout under each folding chair. Tall, fleshy, his hair a rumpled shock, he extracts a stapled handout from its droopy pile and drops the sheaf through his sight line. Sitting under the tech booth, I watch the poet make his way up to my row. He's all out. People will have to share. Earlier, a ripe pear rolled into my classroom like a hand grenade, a beautiful woman chasing it into the dusty corner. As it does in the afternoon, the little theater fills quickly, excited talk now layered in the air. When a spot comes up, a well of light overflows the podium's basin, and the crowd breaks into exuberant applause. Poet doesn't read, per se, a friend whispers into my ear, but proclaims. He's hard of hearing, so has a hard time monitoring his tonal range, the poet explains, nearly unintelligible through the slush of his accent and shy nervousness. When he starts the first poem, a love poem, we struggle to focus on the words on the page. The sound guys scramble to accommodate the poet's delivery, alternately high-pitched and guttural. How he steps in and out of the mic's range. Once he places the page in front of his face, a sunflower swaying in the breeze. The poet reads and proclaims, and sings like a cantor. 
he writes of God and making love on the kitchen floor when he kisses his lover, her stomach tightens. He's part Joseph Brodsky, part runner-up in the poetry slam for angelic deaf mutes. Truth teller, summoner of the gods of earnestness, lightheartedness, and joy, he calls us all to the table of the exalted moment. His allotted 20 minutes go by draped in the shawl of timelessness. We are one mind, wrapped in communal attention, happy in one place as we'll ever be. Later, we will gather on the sun-drenched porch, buzzed from the reading and strong drinks, talking madly through smile-jammed faces. A few of us will stare out mutely into the field. As for the unlucky souls who arrive late and stand outside the theater, unable to see in San's handout, they are lost at the edge of the sea, only wave lap in their ears, gull screech and sun glare. When he's done, the poet steps from the podium, dazed, wiping its drunken eyes. The crowd lifts its head and cheers like tree branches in the wind. Just a small hint of compassion and burgeoning fear for the pretty young novelist who now steps into the light, who herself must summon all her own gods to this replete moment, who must continue despite everything laying out her solid, unmusical lines of prose. <laughs> she gave a great reading, actually, but I did not envy her having to read after that. Um, this poem is called Detour Ahead, and it's a little longer than that one even, but it kind of moves quicker. It's a driving poem. Um, recently, I was a, on a faculty at a Summer kind of greatness. Those conferences are amazingly full of like-minded people and talk. And, and at the same time, I was totally ready to leave when it was time to leave, 24/7. Uh, you know, just and uh, and I had to drive from Raleigh, North Carolina, to New Hampshire. You know, um, and I was really happy to have that time just to drive. And I had my dog with me. Um, and uh, a few things. Um, Bill Evans is a jazz pianist. Scott LaFaro is his bass, was his bass player who was famous for being an incredibly innovative bassist and also for dying young in a car crash. And um, I think that's about it. It's called Detour Ahead. And one week alone on campus spoiled us to everything real in the world, but a heightened camaraderie, quick to reach fever pitch, writers at conference. We stopped only to eat on scheduled beat and to sleep, restless skiffs in the boathouse of dreams. Huddling in clusters, we chatted into the night about everything processed. How could so much fun be so exhausting? I've left it now, thank God, a few hours out of Raleigh, mind unspooling the truth serum pontification a workshop tends to extract from its leader about to fall asleep inside this numb corridor of I-95. What the hell? I turned down the pothole off-ramp into the trough of Philadelphia. Just my luck, the Phillies are at home, and I'm stalled dead center inside the stadium parking crush, bumping forward inch by maddening inch. The radio announces if they lose, the Phils will have accrued 10,000 losses. Some fans punched gut of a stat. I don't care. Wanting only the traffic to open up which, when broad parts its tributary mouth to kiss the wooden teeth of this old city, it eventually does. I've got Evan's explorations on the deck, LaFaro's groove pulse carrying me through the afternoon, murals and storefronts and center lane parked cars, one homeless soul pushing the world's shopping cart brimming with crushed cans, two blocks, and I'm in the land of Starbucks and skyscrapers, men in suits, women in pairs walking fast, there's enough coffee in my system to stun gun an elephant. There's a square, a wrong turn, and for a few lost minutes, one-way streets send me around in circles. The route looks straight enough on the map, a simple drive up into pastoral green. I was hoping Highway 611 would escort me up its urban spine into the river-lined, weedy heart of rural America. Rolling down my window to ask an elderly couple, am I still on broad? Will it take me out of the city? The man throws me a look that says, you know where you're headed, white boy? Then he nods, just keep going straight. I want to tell him that the same year, LaFaro recorded Detour Ahead with Evans in motion on drums, possibly the most synchronized trio ever. He also played on Ornette's Free Jazz, 
that ultimate firework of an album before wrapping his young man's firebird around a tree six months later on New York State Route 20 outside Geneva, which is like orchestrating a game-ending double play, then preparing the five-star meal that night at some hot new bistro, saucepans exploding into many bonfires of applause, then tented by a box of cardboard marinated in piss and dirt, sleeping on a great passerby, uh, sleeping on a great passerbys agree to overlook. A friend's first night in Philly, he's driving down broad in a rental truck, worried by the conspicuous absence of streetlights, run-down buildings leaning in like field oaks, when he comes upon a car on fire. No one around, no police. Windows roll down, he takes in the burning rubber, the crackling heat off the pyre. Me, I'm the only white face in a square mile, a white boy, bubbled by cool jazz, wide awake now, thank you, absorbing as much as I can, open to the heat, the city's talk squabbling with the music. Then when the road bends, I'm in the suburbs, just like that, the long snake of sprawl, pod mall after pod mall, first one township, then another, up in the country now, a green chant of trees, river dancing in and out of sight, small bridges popping brief drum solos under my tires. Pretty soon I'm in the long, cool embrace of the Delaware Gap, breeze washing my face, heading northeast to 84, Evans's my foolish heart subsumed in light, rush of wind, tires whirring inside a brush snare, the day suddenly mine, body resurrected inside each windshield frame moment, catching them like a fish in its porous net. I, that's the first time I read that out loud. Thanks. I need some work. <laughs> um, last poem, and it's, um, I find that I'm writing about like writers' conferences and writing retreats, and I'm, I'm embarrassed that I've written so many, but um, this, this poem is set at a place in Vermont where you get to stay for a month, you get fed amazing food, and you have a room to do your own work and people leave you alone or they spend the night drinking with you and hanging out if you want. And uh, I was there in the, uh, um, in the spring after much rain. Um, and so I had to leave earlier than most of the people I was with. It's also a place where painters are, uh, are visual artists are working. And um, so a lot of visual work is always up and there's a wall by the place where we eat where you can put your artwork up. And uh, I wrote this poem and then put it on the wall uh, th then left. It's called Winter Residency. When the snow dislodges, this poem is set in the winter. I wrote another poem about this place, set in the spring. Duh. Okay. Winter Residency. When the snow dislodges, then drops off the roof in a miniature landslide, it sounds as though a hunter has fired his gun in the woods. A, bulk, a buck bolting from its frozen stance. A reverberation hangs like sulfur in the sun. And I am up here in my room, casting out line after line of poetry, reeling them back in, free to walk around in this robe of sun, to, th to wade through puddles of refracted light, snow glare everywhere. I have just come from, or soon will set out on, another long walk up further into the hills. I trek to the top of my breath, then descend its ladder back to this desk. When I lay down my gloves, lines for poems fall out. When I rise from a nap, scraps of paper float to the floor like snow. The ice on the paths place our feet in a shuffle dance. Go slow. In line for lunch, all I can say to the men and women next to me, who right now are my closest friends, who share with me this abundant board, fresh bread, warm in our grateful hands, is thank you. I'm so glad you didn't have a fire set back there. Yeah. Cause <laughs> Woo. Sure, I can field some questions. Um, maybe I should read that spring poem. No. Um, any questions? <laughs> the green man is his. Huh? With what? No, but off the you often will see figures of a of a vegetative head or a sprouted head. 
with like uh, leaves coming out of it, and it'll be on old churches all through Europe and actually kind of all over the world. It was a pagan symbol of, of like re regeneration and rebirth. Um, and the church, as they often did, were smart to incorporate it into the religion, but not to put it inside the church, just to make sure that it attracted people on the outside of it. Um, and I just found that the green man, uh, just one day a friend of mine, a crazy friend of mine said, the green man has been abducted and is being held hostage in a high, in a high rise. He just said that in conversation. I'm like, what? <laughs> and then I was like, oh yeah, the green man is kind of being held hostage. And, and then I realized I, I'm the green man, you know, and this was, I was much younger. And um, so I've been writing green man poems, thinking that that green man figure is a good figure for ne today, nowadays. I dare to admit it. Any other questions? Betsy. Yeah, I, I start in my head. If a line comes to me or an experience comes, I start to kind of play with it. And then um, I was just telling some of my students um, to, and I don't know if you guys do this, but to to hold back from, a, like if you get an idea for a poem or something, not to write it down, just to kind of let it stay in your head a little bit. And then when it starts to kind of want to come out, I sit down and I write it out or type it out. And then I print it out pretty quickly. I'll take it from the page if I've written it, because I keep notebooks. I'll put it on the on the computer, then print it out, and then fold it and put it in my back pocket and take a walk with my dog and read it out loud and kind of tinker with it, then bring it back to the computer and retype it and then print it out, fold it. And I do that for about a week, and then it's either a piece of crap or it's pretty good, and then I'm done. I mean, I, you know, so that's, kind of, that's definitely how I would do it. Yeah. I'm going to try to get these guys to do that a little bit on a hike. 